In just a few weeks, we are going to be giving away like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars worth of tools here on the channel, and I'm super stoked about that. And in the meantime, I figured I'd actually give y'all a tour, so y'all, when y'all are watching those videos, understand what's happening. This is my wood shop. It is thirty-six by forty-eight, and it is in my backyard in a residential neighborhood inside the city limits. Yes, I run all of this thing out of my backyard, and I'm in the shop four days a week because I spend time with my daughter and watch her on the days where I'm not working. I use this wood shop to be able to. Not only produce content for YouTube, but also produce products to be able to sell locally as well as on Etsy. I figured I'd go ahead and do a tour and tell you all the 10 things that I've learned as I've gone through many different shops. This is my fourth shop actually. My very first one was <laughs> less than the size of a shed. And honestly, there was a lot of stuff about that that I kind of miss at this point. Let's just go ahead and talk about space. I think a whole lot of people realistically want to know like what's the amount of space that I need in order to operate. And I think that a lot of people need to not think about that, but think about what are you trying to actually make? Is this just a hobby? Are you trying to make stuff to sell? Do you have a foot in both of those worlds? Which I would definitely not recommend doing because the second that you try and sell things with your hobby, that's this day that you kill your hobby. For me, I have always viewed woodworking as a way to produce income for my family, whether that is a side hustle or a full-time income, which it is now. I've always viewed these tools as just something to be able to make money. So I'm very hard on my tools and I only buy tools nowadays that actually I can depend on and I know are going to be reliable long term. So if you're in a two car garage and that's all the space that you have, I fully believe that you can run a full time woodworking business out of your two car garage, but it's just about understanding what you're trying to make. When I first started, I figured I needed to buy X, Y, and Z, all these different tools. CNC machines were definitely not accessible like they are nowadays. So I went and bought all of the traditional style power woodworking equipment that you can. And back then, thankfully, it was the day and age of Craigslist and not a lot of used tools were as expensive as they are nowadays. Unfortunately, COVID with the rise of like the maker movement and community, all of that kind of stuff, uh, the price of tools has skyrocketed. So back in my day, like 10 years ago, when I first started a thousand dollars realistically could get you up and running with a shop. Whereas today, I do not think that's really the case. Um, in a lot of ways, it really is your motivations of what you're trying to make. So like I said, if you're in the corner of your garage and you just have like a, a little pegboard set up and a little few little hand tools for woodworking, and that's what you're looking for, like, there's a lot of really great stuff that I miss about that for myself, about just going out and tinkering and making something and not having to worry about clients or deadlines or anything like that. And then stuff like this happens over the course of 10 years. It doesn't certainly it doesn't happen overnight unless of course you had the money just to immediately drop on all this. But for me, this is 10 years of constantly giving any kind of disposable income to this. So that's how I ended up with this space. So in your first consideration, think about the type of space that you have and specifically what you want to use it for. Money, hobby, I wouldn't do both. Now, secondly, I'd like to talk about safety because, you know, if you're in a wood shop, your high probability or possibility of cutting your hands off or, or hurting yourself. And oftentimes people don't think about like this, the simple things of if you have lasers in your shop, have laser glasses, gloves, hearing protection, all that kind of stuff. Realistically, you really only need like a few things when it concerns safety. Either you're going to nick yourself or you're going to hurt yourself so bad that you could bleed out in your shop. But when it concerns safety, just understand where your personal protective equipment is and use it as often as you can. No matter how long you've been doing this, when cutting things, you can always slip up. Um, that is just something about it. This is a very dangerous hobby. If you're squeamish about that, probably shouldn't be in this hobby. Let's talk about electrical capacity. So right here, behind my massive 25 inch planer that currently is being used as a shelf, I have my panel. Now this panel is being run off of a single 60 amp breaker from my house, which sucks. Um, I only have 60 amps to be able to run the shop, which what that realistically looks like is if I am using my CNC machine over here and I have the dust collector running. So the spindle is 220, the dust collector is 220, and then my compressor, which is outside the shop, if that kicks on, that is a load greater than what my house's uh, 60 amp can actually hold. So 60 amp breaker going to that panel, that panel actually shoots over to this little mini panel, which has all of this stuff hooked up onto it, 
one day I'm just gonna have to bite the bullet, retrench out here, and put the power that should have been here in the first place, like probably like 200 amps or something like that, so that I can run everything efficiently and not have to worry about things all happening at the same time and losing power. So when looking at your shop, understanding your power capacity, and honestly, how much of a headache it's gonna be to get power out here is really big. For right now, it works fine. Um, maybe one day I'll have like a very big like water jet machine in here. And that certainly is gonna need a lot more power. So that's number three, power capacity. I don't know why I'm storing my list all the way over here. Number four, tool selection. So like I had talked about earlier, I think a lot of people are under this guise of like, you see people on YouTube with all these shops and stuff and you're like, like, oh man, like, like I have to have all that in order to be successful. That's just not the case. Like half the tools in here I never use, um, maybe once a month. That's just the truth about it. When it concerns my woodworking, I, pretty much live on this wall. I use CNC machines to be able to create stuff. I use the table saw every once in a while to rip things down. I try my hardest to be able to have my material and order that from a company, Peach State Lumber, if you're in the Atlanta area, and I order it plain down two thickness and I order it straight line ripped on one side just to make the process as easy as possible. I think everybody's like under the illusion that you have to have all of the milling equipment and you have to have all of the like fine tune like cutting equipment and then you have to have all the finishing equipment when in reality like I would personally just try and knock out as much of the stuff as possible like I said earlier it's currently being used as a shelf but that Woodmaster planer 25 inch wide I, I love it. I, look, look, when I do use it, it's the perfect tool. I don't ever have to think about it, but most of the time it just kind of sits there. So if you're in a smaller space and you're trying to look at what are the main tools that I need to be buying, that's going to depend on your specific use case. But for somebody like me who's creating small shippable items, you really could just get by with ordering the right material from the get-go with a CNC machine. I know that's going to sound like a CNC commercial, but I don't care if you buy one or not. It's just the way to go if you're looking to make money in woodworking. All right, so five, workbench and assembly area. This is also one of those things that I think that people think they need to like have like the best workbench and there's all these videos on YouTube about like all these different holding methods and creating torsion boxes and blah, 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 this, that, and the other. And I think that's cool if you're in the hobby and you want the best workbench that has ever existed. But for me, somebody who's using this every single day and does not want to create something that's an heirloom quality that I'm going to actually be using, this has been perfect. You see down here, it is just a bunch of junk. This is stuff that I randomly use because I'm not a very organized person. I know that about myself. And the only reason that I have one of these workbenches is because I'm not organized. If I had two of these, one of them would always be a mountain of crap, and then the other one would be half a mountain of crap. So I only have one of these in here. It's a very conscious decision. It makes me mad all the time, but it helps me keep clean as I'm working because this is the space that I have to do this. It is just like two by four framing, and then the top has a piece of plywood. Half of it is waxed, the other half of it is not waxed, and that's because whenever I have to glue things up, whether that's wood glue or CA glue or whatever, I do that on the waxed side, and then the other side does not, because I live in Georgia, and it is hot and humid here all the time, and every once in a while I have something that I wanna set down that I just really wanna make sure doesn't have the possibility of getting wax on it. Uh, that being said, I do cover this a lot with like those moving blankets, the really cheap ones off of Amazon. Uh, those are a godsend when just like needing to do finished sanding and stuff and really making sure that you're not getting any type of marks or burnishing on your finished product. Um, yeah, moving blankets and just a cheap workbench. I think it's the best thing around and especially like if you're using two by fours, you can still clamp to it and everything. And, I don't know, each to their own, I guess. Okay, let's talk about dust collection because that's that's a big one. Um, dust collection, in my mind, is like two different things. It's like, do you have airflow in your shop? So all the airborne particles that are gonna be there regardless of the type of dust collection that you have. So something that's actually blowing that out for people in two-car garage, that's as simple as putting up one of those oscillating stand fans or box fan in the corner and just making sure the air is moving because that fine dust particle is the stuff that really like sticks in your lungs and especially if you're using exotic woods can end up being a really bad thing for you. And then the other stuff is like back there, I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but there's a uh, three horsepower jet cyclone dust collector and it's been fine for the majority of things that I've needed and you have one of those, but then most people normally have like that as well as a shop vac or a 
dust extractor, which I have my Festool dust extractor, which is super useful for my domino as well as my rip saw, which highly recommend either one of those tools. And I have had it for my CNC machine for the longest time until I now have this dust collector from Oneida. And it's essentially like multiple of these little dust extractors into a big machine. So this can actually service one inch to five inch size ports. It is like immediate. Hold your ears. It is by far the best dust collector that I have ever used in my time of woodworking and I cannot say enough about it. Um, it's expensive, but if you're somebody who has the budget and you're looking just to buy one dust collector, not buying high volume, low pressure and a low volume, high pressure and trying to figure out what'll work for, what'll work for each, this is the thing to buy. Like I said, it's expensive, super worth it. Uh, storage and organization. So this is actually going to be one of the projects for Make Timber where I figure out a storage solution with the, one of those like Harbor Freight carts and use all of my most used hand tools and put that in those. But I got this right when COVID hit when everybody was like, oh no, no one's gonna buy anything. And like Home Depot put that on sale for 300 bucks, so I bought it. Nowadays, that's like a thousand dollars. I don't, things have gotten very expensive and it's honestly super, prohibitive for anybody getting into this because they see all the expense and it's like then they're expected to make heirloom quality furniture like day one that takes years of practice to get to that point so like when you're looking at something like that and it's like oh well that guy on youtube has that i need one of those you really don't um i'm going to be creating a budget version of that which honestly i think will be much more useful like half the drawers in that are empty but it is a nice luxury for the things that are in it just for it to be all contained and everything uh, probably not worth a thousand dollars. Oh man, eight is lighting and I've got a lot to say about this. That, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try and set this shot up so that y'all can see like the four different types of lights that are currently in my shop. Uh, maybe that'll work. Okay, so back there you can see these halogen lights. Uh, this used to be a spray booth for like cars and stuff, which I'm turning into my laser office area and it's gonna have AC because I don't really spray huge things anymore. So for all those people who are mad at me that I'm turning a finishing booth in a wood shop into an office, I get it, I hear ya, but um, I'm, I need it for other things. So it has those halogen lights in it, which are like yellow. And then underneath all of my storage racks are these LED fake halogen lights that are from Harbor Freight. They work incredible, but it's obviously a different color temperature. Recently, can you see it or not? Uh, recently, I did those UFO lights <laughs> up here, and I have like 16 of those hanging down, and it provides enough light. Honestly, I'll, I'll link it down below in the description what I actually use, and I kinda need to double up the lights. I'm not using 16, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'm using eight. So I need 16 in here to properly light this place but my electrical bill is so much better. And then lastly, I have like these LED ones on the wall that are right above my CNC machine so I can really see and as well as film. But the consideration that I would look at for all that kind of stuff is not to mix halogen and LED because for filming, especially for time lapses, your shutter speed has to line up with the like the hertz of the light and oh, nothing will make you more mad than sitting down trying to uh, edit a video and all of a sudden it's just banding that I'm not level. All right, ventilation. So right there, that is my ventilation. And what I talked about earlier about like dust management is just making sure that you really do have moving air. So that is not only for fine dust particles, but it's also for just things that are fumy in general. For me, I really want to make sure that things are taken care of well in my shop. So I have all of my highly combustible finishes in here. This is going to be like my hard film finishes. And then I have all of my oil finishes, which is spoiler alert, just one type. I use mineral oil for the majority of my finishing. I have that in tubs because it is not an incredibly fumy thing. But if you do store your finishes in your shop and you don't have a lot of ventilation, that's really gonna get old real quick because you're gonna get used to it and you're not going to think about that. And then when people come into your shop, they're gonna be like, hey, like this is really bad for you. And then by that time you've already exposed yourself and been around it for so long. Um, I get the whole like, we're woodworkers, who cares? We're all gonna die anyways. Like, but you know, there's simple little things that you can do in order to help yourself in the long run. And a lot of times that's just having a box fan around um, and just running that box fan. You know, if it's out of a window or if it's out of a large open area like this, um, 
for me, the people who had this shop before me were, did some stuff with boats. So I've got this huge door right here with 12 foot walls, which I'll stop for a second. If you're building a shop and you're out there and you're considering doing eight foot and it's, you know, like a few thousand dollars to, to make it 12 foot or 10 foot, do 10 foot or 12 foot because the second that you have eight foot boards and you're flipping those over yourself and you hit a joist, oh, so mad. My last shop was like right at eight foot and just flipping over sheets of plywood and stuff is so annoying. Having 12 foot walls and a 12 foot ceiling is such a luxury. So if you're out there, you're building something, you're looking to consider like, what is going to be helpful for you? Tall walls. Tall walls over more space, honestly, it, at least in my mind. Uh, and then workflow efficiency. So like this is gonna be a little bit different for everybody and what you're looking to accomplish in your shop. Like I was talking about, I am turning this area specifically to be used for lasers. Now, a long time ago, I would have tried to build all these racks out of wood and everything. And for me, since this space is meant to make money, I really just want things to be easy and simple and repeatable. So I have a lot of these racks. I got those from Costco. It's by far the cheapest way to get those. They're not as tall as the ones from Home Depot. Uh, so like you could hit your head on this, but they're plenty strong and like they're very manageable. If I have more space in here, I'll put more of these racks because it creates little individual stations. Underneath this is a project that I'm working on right now. It's one of my dream projects that to my knowledge, no one's ever done. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. So I'm not showing that off yet, but hopefully it'll be live on the channel. Uh, maybe it'll be a make timber project. I'm not sure if I can figure it out in time or not. Some things are beyond myself and it's hard to ask help from other individuals without giving away what's happening, knowing that they could do it much faster than me. Back to efficiency. So <laughs> when you're looking at your shop, understand what you're trying to accomplish. You can't be efficient unless you understand the end goal, right? So if you're just setting up a shop to hopefully offer anything and everything to anyone and everyone, it's going to create a lot of stress, not only on your shop, but also on you because you probably are building that thing for the very first time and trying to figure it out. So you're offering it a discounted rate. Therefore you're like putting out to the world, hey, I'm really cheap. And it's just gonna create this sense of you're not a business person, but you're now out of your hobby and it's really gonna crush that. So if you are in this for the hobby, definitely do it for the hobby. Enjoy the, the YouTube woodworking stuff. Don't get caught up too much in, in a lot of the hype about you need X, Y, and Z in order to be successful. Do something that you love and really enjoy it at face value. Um, if you're trying to do woodworking to make money, if I could go back to myself 10 years ago, back to uh, my first little <laughs> shop in a shed, I would say, Hamilton, choose birdhouses. Only build birdhouses and build birdhouses so well and better than anybody else that you have this weird little niche birdhouse and build that to the best of your ability so that people know Hamilton builds birdhouses. What I unfortunately did was tell everybody, oh, I've got a wood shop, I can do whatever, which included birdhouses and cutting boards and serving trays for people's houses and tables and chairs and stools and kitchen islands and anything in between, which sure, over time gave me a lot of skills. But in the meantime, it really did not do anything for my self-confidence and what I was able to achieve as a maker or as a business person or anything like that. So uh, hopefully this rambling was helpful for somebody out there. Really appreciate all of my supporters on Patreon. Y'all are super awesome. Make Timbers coming. Um, I think I'm gonna have like a, for all the people who've stayed till the very end, I know y'all are people who I actually really want your opinion down in the description it'll or maybe like a pinned comment or something like that i'll have a survey monkey survey and i'm just going to ask a few questions about make timber i might actually have two based because it's free and eh. so like there might be one survey about like the type of projects that you're looking for and another survey asking a few other questions so if uh if you uh, if you click on that if like five or ten of y'all did it would be super helpful for me to understand uh kind of where we're going and if you're interested in filling that out yeah i think all the results are public so you can see what everybody else thinks as well um so yeah i've been working really hard on make timber i'm really excited about it and i hope y'all are too because you know regardless if it's horrible you know i'm still giving away like 15 or twenty thousand dollars worth of tools so hey there's that all right bye